In this session, we'll go over the high yield material commonly tested on step one on the heme and onc section. We begin with sickle cell disease. The problem here is that in position six, there's a missense mutation where glutamic acid, which has a positive charge, is replaced with, a, with valine, which has no charge. Um, and so the, the, the molecules aren't formed properly. Um, in contrast to that with hemoglobin C, the, the glutamic acid is switched to lysine. Um, which also has a positive charge, and because you're not actually changing the charge, you went from positive glutamic acid to positive lysine, the effects aren't as severe. Also note that with sickle cell, with the disease, you get the autosplenectomy, the dactylitis, and the acute coronary syndrome, but if you only have the trait, you'll present with episodic hematuria. Hereditary spherocytosis, the condition over there is when the red blood cells are too large. You have that increased MCHC, the really central pallor, and because the cells are too large, um, they can't fit through the small spaces in the spleen, and so they get attacked, and, and that's one of the problems over there. With beta thalassemia, be aware that the problem is a mutation on the COSAC sequence, so you can't start uh, DNA transcription. Um, with proxismal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, um, where you have no CD55 or 59, so the complement attacks red blood cells. Um, in this condition, you are actually hypercoagulable, so you can form DVTs, which is something that gets tested. Um, and a, acute intermittent perforia, uh, the, the enzyme that you're missing over there is porphyrobilinogen deaminase, um, and you want to treat that with glucose and a heme infusion. Um, the way that I remember that is, I think, acute, like a, an acute situation where you need the police department. Um, police department is PD, so porphyrobilinogen, porphyrobilinogen deaminase. Um, moving, uh, finally, um, with any red blood cell problem, uh, just to review this, when your red blood cells explode, they release LDH, which is inside of them, so your LDH value goes up, um, and they also release hemoglobin. Um, so hemoglobin doesn't just float by itself. A molecule called haptoglobin needs to bind to it, um, and so your haptoglobins are being used up, so those go down. So th those are going to be the lab values that you see with many, t many red blood cell disorders. Moving on to clotting disorders, von Willebrand's factor deficiency is, is very high, high yield. Um, in this condition, you don't have von Willebrand's factor, so you'll present with uh, a woman who has uh, heavy periods or someone who has a lot of bleeding, nosebleeds. And the problem here, of course, is, is von Willebrand's factor naturally forms a bridge between the platelets and the collagen. Um, and the other thing that it does is it stabilizes and protects factor eight. Um, and so if you're missing von Willebrand's factor, you can't make that bridge. So the platelets are fine, the platelet count will be normal, but because you can't actually start the coagulation process, um, you'll have an increased bleeding time. And also in regarding the factor eight, because it can't protect and carry factor eight, um, you'll, you'll have an increase in the PTT. Factor seven, I put it up here because it's quite interesting in, in that it's the first one to go away if you have cirrhosis. It has the shortest half-life. Um, and also, if you give a vitamin K infusion and someone has an increased PT, um, the vitamin K infusion does not help. That actually indicates a factor seven deficiency. Regarding cancers, chronic lymphocytic leukemia and small lymphocytic leukemia uh, come up uh, in re regarding smudge cells. Uh, they like you to know that the smudge cells are B cells and they smudge while you're preparing the slide. Um, and because B cells are, are, are defective, you have uh, impaired humoral immunity. Langerhans cell histiocytosis, again, very high yield. Uh, in this condition, you have lytic bone lesions uh, uh, in a child. Uh, we'll have lytic bone lesions, maybe a rash, maybe recurrent uh, ear infections because you can have a mass at the mastoid bone. Um, these, you see CD100, you see S100 positive. S100 is marker for mesoderm, so it's also, for example, in schwannomas, um, but it's also CD1A positive. Um, you see those Burbeck granules, which look like tennis rackets. And very importantly, they activate the T cells. The medications that are high yield, heparin is very important. This is a very large negative molecule. Acts as a blood thinner. Um, because it's so large and negative, it can't cross the placenta, so it's safe during pregnancy. Um, and because it is a large negative molecule, if you want to reverse heparin uh, toxicity or an overdose, for example, uh, someone's bleeding too much, you would give them a large positive molecule like protamine sulfate. The low molecular weight heparins have the advantage that they can be used in outpatient, but the disadvantage that there's no reversible agent as of right now. And if someone 
uh, takes heparin and then gets thrombocytopenic. Uh, you need to worry about heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. The pathophysiology here is that heparin forms uh, a complex with platelet factor 4. And if the body attacks that with IgG, when the IgG hits this complex, it activates platelets. And so platelets get activated, so you actually get clotting, and, they actually, and they're also being destroyed, so you get the thrombocytopenia. If someone does get heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, the next, and you need to anticoagulate them, uh, you'd go for a DTI, direct thrombin inhibitor. Aspirin is high yield in that it's an irreversible COX-1 and COX-2 inhibitor. Signs of an overdose would include ear ringing and a seizure, and that you first would get a respiratory alkalosis followed by a metabolic acidosis, which you would treat with bicarb. Doxyrubicin is used for Hodgkin's lymphomas. Uh, this medication can cause cardiomegaly, um, and it's usually given with dexrefiraxamine to prevent the adverse effects. The last medication to be aware of here are the serums, tamoxifen and raloxifen. These are both T-cell agonists. They'll stimulate the T-cells, uh, but they're antagonists on the breast tissue. Um, and so they, they can be useful in breast cancers. The problem with tamoxifen though is that it's also somewhat of an agonist on the endometrial tissue, so it increases your risk for endometrial cancers. Um, but if you have a patient with, a, for example, a hysterectomy, uh, tamoxifen is a, is a fine choice. And both of them, any serum, tamoxifen or raloxifen, uh, increase your risk for DDTs. Uh, these are, I think, the most high yield points that are commonly tested. Obviously, this is not everything, um, but the, these are very commonly tested things. Uh, that's about it. Um, I will take a second to explain if anyone's curious why I have this on. Uh, yesterday I used a lot of super glue and it got on my finger and I saw online that you can use a shaver to get the super glue off. Terrible idea.